أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على شرف الأنبياء وسيد المرسلين وحبيب إله العالمين بالقاسم محمد وعلى الأهل البيت الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المقرمين غير الميامين سيما بقية الله في الأرزين حجته وخلائك الأجمعين سيدنا وإمام زماننا وصاحب نعمتنا وولي أمرنا مهدي هذه الأمة وتعوس أهل الجنة الحجة بن, هل... الحجة بن الحسن الأسكري فداه وأرواه العالمين اللهم صل على Please recite a salwat. We thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He has given us an opportunity to be here in the commemoration of Abu Abdullah al Hussein, to commemorate this great tragedy. We have been commemorating this tragedy throughout our lifetimes. The reason why we do this, the reason why we commemorate this great tragedy is because it is the love of Ahlul Bayt that within us that brings us to this Imam Barga every day for the 40 nights in Muharram and Safar. However, as we come here and commemorate this tragedy, what we have to ask ourselves is that are we implementing the lessons that we take away from this Imam Barga? It is paramount that we realize this and it is essential that we try and implement the lessons that we take from this member. The reason why I have picked this topic to discuss within this short time, it is because if you analyze the history of Karbala, when you analyze the companions in Karbala, you find that these companions were people with the Imam who were not people who had known the Imam throughout, yet these were people who came to know him through his journey towards Karbala. There were other people who were friends of the Imam, such as Habib, and he came to the aid of the Imam. However, at the same time, look at the people who were on the opposite side to the Imam. People like Shimmer, people like Umar ibn Saad, these were people who had a connection to the Imam or who had served in the army of the uh, Imam al Hassan and Imam Ali. So it was not such that these people had never served the former Imams, yet they had. And to, when it comes to Karbala, we find them opposing the Imam of their time. But let us put Karbala to one side and look at what happens in history after. When after the event of Karbala, when the Umayyad regime falls and the Abbasids come to power, we find within the history of Shia Islam that there is a deviation after, certainly after most of the Imams, but after the seventh Imam, it is a very prominent distinction. The group known as Waqifis separate and form their own deviant religion. But you know what is surprising and at the same time very shocking to learn is that the person who actually creates, who actually causes this deviation by the name of Ziyad al-Qandi, who is also the representative of the seventh Imam, he testifies to the Imamat of the eighth Imam, yet he is the one who leads this deviation. So what is this message, That what is the message here for us from history? And the reason why I wish to focus on history is that if we examine the last will of Imam Ali, Salaam Allah Alayhi, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. He says in his will to his son, Imam Hassan, Salaam Allah Alayhi, that 
O oh my son, examine history in such depth that it is as if you have lived amongst those people of those times. You realize why they made those choices and you realize why they, 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 they took those actions. And how is this related to us in, to, in this day and age? We are also waiting for an Imam. We are also waiting for the Imam to return so we can inshallah be in his army. However, when we examine the signs of the coming of the Imam of our time, what we find is that there is a, a very prominent hadith in the Kitab al ghaiba of Numani. It says that the people who were actively awaiting the Imam would be the very first people to go against him. And the people who would used to worship the moons and the stars would be the people who will follow the Imam. You know, when we read these words, we think, you know, I certainly think to myself, I hope I'm not one of those people who is calling the Imam. But when the Imam comes, I'm on the opposite side. But at the same time, I have to ask myself, have I done enough to be in the side of the Imam? This love of Ahlul Bayt, Salaamu Ajma'een, is a great blessing that we have. You know, we come here, we commemorate this tragedy. However, if this love is not implemented into our actions, then this love is just mere lip service. How can we change this? How can we implement this love into our actions? Alhamdulillah, Mawlana Sahib has been talking about these different attributes, different practical steps that we need to do. I'll leave you with a simple, a small extract from the Dua Abu Hamza Tumali of our fourth Imam, Imam as sajjad Salaamu Alaihi this dua is a very long dua. However, within this dua, if you cannot read all of the dua in one go, have a read of the extracts of these dua, like short passages. They're wonderful and very insightful passages. And I've picked one of the passages where the Imam says, he cries out and says, and help me to cry for myself, for I have wasted my life away with procrastination. Procrastination means ghafla here. I wasted my life in ghafla and away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And false hope. And this false hope is something that we all are guilty of. I'm guilty of it as well. You know, when it comes to namaz time, I'm like, let's delay the namaz. You know, maybe I'll pray. There's enough time. When it comes to repentance, one of the most important aspects of reforming ourselves to turn, bring the soul back to life, we say, you know, I'm young now, I can wait a few years. But the reality is that this delay, this deliberate delay that we cause ourselves deviates further away from the, the path of Islam. We do not realize the whales close in on us and we are distant from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the Imam says that, you know, I've wasted my life away with procrastination and false hope, and now I have come to you, O Allah, hopeless of my goodness. This is the Imam talking. These are not my words. What do we need to do? How do we awaken ourselves from this ghafla? How do we bring about this change? Interestingly, in another passage of the dua, the Imam talks about the, the attributes that we need to implement. And he talks about contemplation. He talks about having good deeds, doing good deeds, doing good for others. And then he mentions something else. He mentions that spend your time with the ulama of your time, the good ulama. Why is that? Because when you spend your time with someone who is a man of God, who is pious, you yourself start to 
take on his attributes, you start to change your own character. And it is important in this day and age, we recognize who are the righteous ulama. We live in a time which is plagued with uncertainty, plagued with confusion. And none of us can say for certainty that it is null. It says in the signs of the coming of the Imam that this era, it will be so confusing that people, like Mulana mentioned, the people would not know if their faith is there or not. The other thing the ulama mentioned on how to reform ourselves, how to awaken ourselves from ghafla, is to pray on time. Lama Qadi Tabatabai, one of the greatest RF, who was the teacher of Ayatollah Bahajat and Lama Tabatabai and these likes, he says, and he makes a very great claim, he says that a person who prays for 40 days his prayers on time, at the time of the prayer, and does not see his, a change in his soul, in his spirituality, he can curse me. That is a big claim. But I'll tell you, I've seen people who have done that and they've seen a change. And you know, that is the biggest thing that we need to do. Yes, we have jobs, yes, we have school, college, university, everything. But taking that time away and praying on the, the time of the prayer is essential as well. That is the difference. When you come to Karbala, what do you see? Hur prays behind Imam al Hussein when he stops him. He doesn't pray separately. He even says to the Imam, we will pray behind you. He realizes the importance of prayer behind the Imam as well. And that is what we need to understand. That is what we need to have the marifa. But this tragedy has an emotional attachment as well. And that is the tragedy that the Imam went through. And after him, what the ladies of the household went through. The Imam gave everything for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to save the message of Islam. He gave the, ha the arms of his Abbas he gave the wail of his sister Zainab. He gave the chest of Ali and Akbar. He even gave the neck of Ali and Azgar to the three-pronged arrow. His mission was to ensure that Islam is saved in Karbala. But you know what shook the foundations of the regime of the time? It was the sermons of his sister Lady Zainab Salah. Lady Zainab, you know what is her title? Her title is Ummul Masai, the mother of grief, the mother of sorrow. And this title is because of everything she saw during her lifetime. When she was little, she saw the door kicked in on her mother, Fatima to Zahra. When it came to Ram that night on the 19th of Ramzan, she saw her father bleeding from her head and his beard red with blood. And then there was a time when she took out the arrows from the coffin of Imam al Hassan. And then it comes to Karbala where she's standing on Tilizainabiya looking at Shimmer cutting the head of Imam al Hussein. But look at this lady, she endures everything and she goes to Sham and she shakes the foundation. But there was tragedy there as well. When they reached to the gate of Sham, Umm um Kulsum, sister of Lady Zainab, makes a request to Shimmer and she says, take us from the gate which has the least of the people. But this, this oppressor takes them through a gate where the most people were waiting to see them. And when they come into the courtyard of Yazid, they see the tragedy there as well. But my brothers and sisters, this was a lady who had seen everything. She had sacrificed her sons. But you know, she had never cried for her sons, never. From Karbala to Kufa to Sham, she never cried. Even on that day when the heads of the Shahada were returned, 
She cried over and she did matam over, the, she lamented over the head of Imam al Hussein. Salah. But when does she remember her sons? When she comes back to Medina, she goes into her house and she sees there's two small beds and there's prayer mats next to it. And she turns to Karbala and she realizes and she calls out to her sons, On and Muhammad. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun.